<clears throat> now, when we go out soul winning, one of the first things we ask people, apart from going to church, is, you know, if you were to die today, are you 100% for sure that you'd go to heaven? And it's a real common question, and most people don't seem to have a problem with it. But the concept that the moment you die, the possibility of going to heaven is there, is important because that is the way that it works. If you are saved and you, know, you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the moment that your body physically dies, you go to heaven. And the same, at the same token, those that are not saved, the moment that they die, they will go to hell. There is no in-between stage. There is no purgatory. There is no, you know, just hanging out on the earth and just spirits wandering around. That doesn't happen. I'm going to prove to you that from the Bible. And the title of my sermon this evening is The Dangerous Doctrine of Purgatory. Now, obviously, purgatory is something that's mainly taught by the Catholic Church. And I'm going to be covering some of those points. But I want, you, I want to be able to prove it to you from the Bible. We're going to look at Scripture and just show you um, what the Bible says about this. Because when, when, our body, when our spirit is absent from our body, that's when we're dead. And that's what it says in James, at least, that the... the even so, the body without the spirit, as the body without the spirit is dead, so the, the faith without works is dead also, in James chapter 2. So, we are dead when our, when our spirit, when our soul departs from our body, right? That's the moment that we're dead. And when it departs, though, there's only two places that it's going to go. And it happens immediate. And I'm going to prove that to you. Look in, we, we started off in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Look down in verse number 6. The Bible reads, Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. He's saying, look, the whole time that we're alive, the whole time that we have our being inside of this physical fleshly body, we're absent from the Lord. We're not with the Lord. He says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say in verse 8, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Now, you can look at that verse, and it, and it says that we would rather be with God than in our body. But the implication there is that once you are absent from your body, you are going to be with the Lord. It's, it's a very um, simple, you know, it's not, it's not some large leap to, to read this and read into that, that yes, the moment that we are absent, if you're saved, the moment you're, you're absent from your body, you will be present with the Lord. And turn, if you would, to Luke 16, because we'll see another example of this. In Luke 16, we're going to see actually the, the, what happens in this story that Jesus tells about the rich man and Lazarus. And it's a great story. Tell, you know, it's, it's, somewhat, it's a story I like showing people about the reality of hell. It gives you the name of a real person. And it, and it talks about something that happened. You know, he was a poor man. And, you know, he was begging for food at the rich man's table and, and everything else. And we're going to read just, just a, a few verse, <coughs> verses from this, par from this story. It's not, I don't even think it's a parable. I think it's a story. Parables are usually fictitious. I believe that this is a real event with a real man, with, with two real men, with the rich man and with Lazarus that actually happened and is recorded for us in the Bible. And Jesus is telling us this story. Look at verse 22 of Luke 16. The Bible says, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. So the beggar, the poor man, Lazarus, was a saved man. Now, he was poor on this earth. You could, he didn't have very much goods. He, he had to beg for food. You know, the dogs licked his sores. He had a real rough time on this earth. But when he died, what happened? He was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. God's angels took him immediately. And, and took him to heaven. And again, you know, I don't believe in this little compartment of, hell, of, of paradise and hell and all this other nonsense. I'm not going to preach and expose that whole false doctrine tonight. But Because um, I'm going to be more focused just on purgatory. But we see here, immediately when he dies, he's carried by the angels and Abraham's with him. And the moment that you die, you're going to be carried by the angels into heaven. Okay? It says, the rich man also died and was buried. So this guy's dead. They buried him. And then it says in verse 23, and in hell, 
he lift up his eyes being in torment. So basically, immediately, right as soon as he dies, he has enough time to just lift, lift up his eyes, right? From looking down, you lift up his eyes. Wow, I'm in hell. Just, just like that. And he sees Abraham afar off, and they have this conversation, you know, Lazarus in his bosom. There's this great gulf that's, that's between them, of course, because there is a great gulf fixed between heaven and hell right now. There's a large gulf. But somehow they miraculously allow this conversation to take place and everything else that goes on in this story for the purpose of being in the Bible and teaching us about hell and, about, and, and you know, how horrible it is and, and everything else. You know, Jesus had his purpose for for allowing this to happen. And um, we see this story. But basically, we see from both of these places that the moment you die, you're either going to wind, you're either open up your eyes, lift up your eyes, you're going to be in hell, or you're going to be carried by the angels into heaven. And it's going to happen like that. It's going to happen right away as soon as you die. There is no, the Bible teaches nothing else. There's no other in between spaces or anything like that. Now, you can say, well, Pastor Persons, why are you even teaching on purgatory? You know, that's some Catholic doctrine. Well, to be honest with you, turn back, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We were in 2 Corinthians 5. We're sorry, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. There are actually, believe it or not, Baptist churches that have their Baptist version of purgatory. And it's slightly different than the Catholics. Now, when I was looking up some of the, you know, for this sermon, I know a lot about what the Catholics believe just from talking to them and everything else, but I don't know every single nailed down doctrine of the Catholic Church, nor do I want to, because it's false. But when I looked this up, the, the, one of the more recent things they were saying is that the Catholic Church is teaching that, well, purgatory is not even necessarily a place. It's just a state of being, which talk about getting just real liberal and weird with your doctrines. I mean, how in the world can purgatory not be a place? Well, then where are you? They'll say heaven's a place. They'll say hell's a place. But purgatory is not a place. It's just a state of being. And they'll say, and there's no fire per se, but you're being separated from God is, is, is like a fire inside of you. <laughs> yeah. It is, and, and, it's, and it's ridiculous. But they'll say hell as fire, right? But, but this is where the liberal concept of hell even creeps in. We go out soul winning, and I run into people that say, oh, yeah, they believe hell is just figurative. Oh, well, it's just so bad. It, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses will say, oh, the, the suffering that you're going to experience, and all these verses that talk about suffering is just because you're suffering because you're, no, you're not going to be with God. As if that is what the extreme torture and torment is for people who don't want to have anything to do with God, that they're going to be separated from God. And it's nonsense. It's ridiculous because the Bible is very clear about a literal, fiery, burning hell in many places. Jesus Christ himself warned about hell. Where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Quench means it's put out. It's never put out. The fire, what, if people were annihilated, which is what like the Jehovah's Witnesses teach. If people just got burnt up and they don't spend eternity in hell, they just, they just go and then they just cease to exist. Why would the flames of hell be eternal? Why would the flames never be quenched? Why would it, the smoke of their torment ascend up forever and ever and ever, as Revelation 14 says? Why would it even say these things if it's just something that happened just like, boom, you would just need a big flashbang, like a bomb. Like, okay, well, what's going to destroy all these souls? and they won't, see, they won't be tormented forever as they believe, then why would the flames of hell never be extinguished? It makes no sense whatsoever. But the, their whole belief system makes no sense whatsoever. It's a false cult system that was, that was originated by one man, and um, as all cults are started. But here, you know, there's a Baptist purgatory. Are you in 1 Corinthians chapter 3? Look at verse 15, because this is, this is one of the verses that, this is also used as ev evidence by the Catholics, but, but that the, the Baptist version of, of the purgatory, and just so you know, the, what the Baptist version is that I'm talking about, the one that I'm referring to, and maybe there's other weird false doctrines that are similar to this, that I know of a teaching that Baptists believe, that they'll call themselves an independent, fundamental Baptist, King James-only Baptist church. But they believe that if you aren't a good enough Christian and define good enough, right? They never can. Just like all the works-based salvation people can never define what is good enough.
to make the mark. But they'll say, if you are not good enough, at the return of Jesus Christ, when he sets up his 1,000-year reign on this earth, when he establishes his government and he comes to rule and reign on the earth, if you are not a good enough Christian, some Baptists believe that you will be in hell being tortured and tormented for, those, uh, for the entirety of those 1,000 years. It doesn't say that anywhere in the Bible. But it's a bizarre, false doctrine. And ultimately what it is, is this, it's this Baptist version of the Catholic version of purgatory. Because what the Catholics believe about purgatory, that word purg, you know, think about purgatory, it's a purging. It's, 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 a, it's a purging of your sins and washing away and, and, it's, and it's a cleansing of all of your sins to say, well, yeah, and it's only for people. And it's really bizarre. And I, I, you know, they'll say, well, you're forgiven of your sins through Jesus, but the people who just weren't living very good, they still have, they're still dirty. Like the cleansing that Jesus gave them wasn't enough. He forgiven their sins, so that that's why they're not going to hell. But they're still dirty. So they need to just be purged of those sins in purgatory. And it's similar to what the, what the Baptists believe on, uh, on, on this, this bizarre, false, heretical teaching that a Christian, someone who's saved, can spend a thousand years in hell. Hell is a place of the dead. Hell is a place for people who are not saved, where you get tortured and tormented forever and ever and ever. It's eternal punishment. Ne never does the Bible say you will suffer 1,000 years in the lake of fire or in, or in the heart of the earth. Never. Not in one place. But you're in 1 Corinthians 3.15. This is one of the verses that they'll, that they'll turn to and try to extrapolate this from. This is talking about the judgment seat of Christ. And it talks about, you know, the works that you perform and, and the good works and, the, you know, the, the bad works and whatever works you do are going to be tried. They're going to be tested by fire before God. And it says the wood, hay, and stubble, the works that you do that are wood, hay, and stubble, they're going to be burned up. But, the, but the, the gold and the silver and the precious stones, the stuff that has lasting value, when, he, when it's tried with fire, they're going to abide the fire because fire can't burn up gold and silver and precious stones. It's going to remain, Right? The, the wood, hay, and stubble, they just get burnt up and they, and they go into ashes, they go into nothing. And this is an illustration, first of all, in the Bible of works being burned up because literally your works are not literally hay and wood. Like that's not your works that you're doing with your life. When God is judging your whole life and all the works that you've done, it's not going to be a literal piece of wood. It's not going to be literal hay and be like, this is literally what you did with your life. These are your works. It's hay. It's figurative. He's using these examples of saying, yeah, you know, your works were good for nothing because as soon as I try it with fire, it's just going to burn up. It does not take a, a Bible scholar to understand this concept that he's simply giving us this, this illustration to help us to understand. But look at verse number 15. It says, If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved yet so as by fire. So they take that phrase, oh yeah, see, yet so as by fire. That means that, yeah, he's saved, but at the judgment seat of Christ, if his works are all burned up, then he is going to suffer a thousand years in fire. But he's still going to be saved, and they use this phrase, in eternity. Instead of saying you have eternal life, which is life that never, that never ends, as I showed that, that woman out soul winning today in the book of John, Chapter 11, when Jesus Christ said, And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die, believest thou this? That's eternal life. He says, look, if, you, if you're alive today and you believe in him, you're never going to die. But what is hell? What is that place? The lake of fire is death. It's referred to as death. It's the place of death. So if you go to hell... How can you say you have eternal life? You're not alive. And, and you know, th that's the, the concept that the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses will try to throw at you too and say, oh, well, yeah, you can have eternal life but still be in hell. No, my friends, that's not life. That's death. The dead are in hell. That's why in Revelation chapter 20, it talks about the, the, the dead, or the, the, you know, hell and the sea giving up the dead that are in them. And the dead being brought back at the, at the great white throne judgment. The dead come out because they're dead, because they don't have eternal life, because they never believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
It's, a, it's an easy concept, but they'll say that. They'll say, see, yet so as by fire. And they'll also say, um, well, wait a minute. If after you're dead, it says here he's suffering. Well, how could you suffer if you're saved? It says he's suffering. Look, when it says you're going to suffer loss, it just means that what you could have done with your life, the rewards you could have received, the works you did, they're gone. They're burnt up. It's nothing. You could have gotten a reward, but you didn't. So yeah, that's your suffering of loss. It doesn't mean, it, it is not, not anywhere close to on the same level as suffering in hell. They'll say, see, well, if, if a, if a born-again believer, because this is talking about a saved person standing before the judgment seat of Christ, right? They'll say, and, and, and I believe that. This is a born-again believer that's, that's being judged by his works for Jesus Christ. Not to, for salvation, but just for, to receive rewards. His works are being judged. He's going to suffer loss. You're going to suffer loss if you didn't do anything for Christ. But it doesn't mean it, that suffering of loss isn't the same as being tortured and tormented in flames. Two different things. Suffering really is just, you know, oftentimes you see the word suffer, it's allowed. You know, it's allowed to have Jesus suffered them to do things unto him. He allowed it to happen. And you will experience loss, the loss of everything you did with your life, to get nothing in return. That's a loss. You spend your whole life doing something and, and trying to create something and then it's, it just all comes to absolutely nothing. That's a loss, which means you get zero rewards. But it doesn't mean, well, because you didn't do anything, now you're going to hell. God never says that in order to avoid hell, you just have to do all of these good works. In order to avoid hell, you need to get saved. You need to put your faith in Jesus Christ. That's how you avoid hell. That would be the same. And we use this analogy a lot about being born again because Jesus says you must be born again and all the relations of, of talking about a parent and their child, a father and his son, and the discipline that you receive as a son. Look, if my son or my daughters went their entire life and did nothing for me, am I going to say, well, you did absolutely nothing with your life. Now you're going to burn in the oven for a thousand years. No, that's not what a loving father would do. The loving father, when he disciplines us, when we do wrong, it's for our betterment. It's to make us better people because we are still alive and we can still change our actions and do things that are right and wrong and, and change our behavior. That when I discipline my children, it's, it's in order to change their behavior. That's the point of a discipline. But torture is different than discipline being tormented, that's not discipline anymore. That's not correction. That's you are being punished for, you know, in, in this case, in the case of hell, for not receiving Christ. You had all those sins. You have to pay for that punishment now. So this is, this is one of the verses that they'll use, and the Catholics will use this too, but I don't want to go too far. You know, the, the, the Baptist version is so just twisted and bizarre that it, 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 makes, and it makes no sense whatsoever. But I'm going to cover a little bit more now about just the Catholic idea of purgatory. Because it's a similar type of thing, is that they'll say, well, you need to be purged of all your sins. You, know, you still somehow retain your sin, regardless of Jesus Christ paying for all of your sins and nailing them to the cross. Right? The... the, the um, the ordinances that were against us, you know, that he nailed to the cross. I, I, I don't know how they missed that. But um, the idea of Catholic purgatory actually became a, became a, big, a big issue around the time of the Reformation because just prior to that, around the time of Martin Luther and, these other, you know, and John Calvin, these guys who, who came out of the Catholic Church, which they were still Catholic. They were Catholic priests and they, you know, they come out of the Catholic Church trying to just make it a little bit better. One of the things that was going on was what's called the sale of indulgences. And this is something that the Catholic Church did. I mean, and this is historical fact. You can look this up for yourself. What they would do is say, okay, you have done these sins or whatever. If you pay X dollars for each various sin, then you will be absolved of those sins. And as, as your, you know, your penance, it would be money. 
Now, instead of money, they could say like, oh, well, you have to say this many Hail Marys and this many Our Fathers and this, you know, and do all these other things to show that you're really sorry for what you did and to somehow make up for your sin, which the, the, the wages of sin is death. Okay, the punishment for our sin is hell. So saying a bunch of repetitive prayers in a row, I don't see how that pays for your sin in the first place. It doesn't. That's why I don't see it, because it doesn't. Because it's, it's a lie. But what they were doing is saying, okay, if you did this type of sin, then you have to, you know, this much money will get you absolved of that sin. And they were selling, and that's why I call it the sale of indulgences. What's an indulgence? When you indulge in things that, that you shouldn't be doing, you know, I'm going to indulge in alcohol tonight. It means you're going to drink a lot of alcohol. I'm going to indulge in this sin. I'm going to indulge in that sin. But hey, it started giving people the idea of, well, if I have enough money, then I could just live however I want to live. And I'll just pay for it. And say, here you go. Here's some more bucks. And I'm good. God's okay with me. And this is the, the wicked corruption of the Catholic Church. I was just, just trying to, to get, um, get a bunch of money. Now, I found an article here because I remember hearing about this with Pope Francis, even in, you know, this was back, the sale of indulgence things happened a long time ago. A lot of people were getting upset about it because it's so blatant, blaring hypocrisy and just, fal just, just falsehood not found in Scripture anywhere to just say, give me money and, and I'll forgive you your sins and your sins can be forgiven. It's so backwards and completely contrary to Scripture that like even Catholics were waking up. I mean, they were even saying like, come on now, this is crooked. You know, that's not right. People can, can, even within the Catholic Church, be seeing this and be like, you know, you just want my money. Not everyone's an idiot. I mean, you, even if you're deceived by a false religion, not everyone's going to fall for that. They're going to be like, wait a minute, you know, come on now. That's, I, I can see what you're doing. You can understand, you can see a scam artist. You know, hopefully, if you, if you have any intelligence whatsoever, you get a scam artist a mile away. And you can see what they're trying to do, whether they're in the church or out of the church, when they're trying to just, just take your money from you. Well, that's what was happening here in the Catholic Church. But what happened recently with, the, with this new pope, this great liberal you know, pope who's, who's spreading all kinds of blasphemy, I, I read this article, and I'll just read this for you briefly, about um, how, because the, they still have this, this attitude of being forgiven of sins. Outside of Christ, just based on your works and the things that you do. And basically, the, these types of things that you receive will limit the amount of time that you have to spend in purgatory because you've already taken care of that sin. So th th their understanding is when you go to purgatory, well, you have an X amount of sins and you need to be purged of these sins and, and it's a process. And then when you finally get all of that stuff taken care of, then you get to go to be a heaven. And they're giving, they're giving you options to say, okay, well, if you start doing these things, you won't have to spend as long in purgatory because your sin will already have been taken care of. And it's all outside of Christ. Re listen to this. It says, this is just a little history, and this is from, um, oh, I forget what website. It was like the Daily Mail or something. Um, wrote up this article on Pope Francis. It says, Indulgences these days are granted to those who carry out certain tasks. So when you do good works, um, you receive the, the indulgence. It says, such as climbing the sacred steps in Rome, reportedly brought from Pontius Pilate's house after Jesus scaled them before his crucifixion. A feat that earns believers seven years off purgatory. You get that? I mean, this is what the Catholic Church teaches. If you go and you climb those sacred, if you make a, a pilgrimage out to Rome and you climb these sacred steps, seven years off your term in purgatory. It's like a jail cell. I mean, it's like you get say seven years for good behavior right there, knocked off your sentence. All you got to do is fly over to Rome and, and climb up these steps. It says, but attendance at events such as the Catholic World Youth Day in Rio de Janeiro, a week-long event starting on July 22nd, can also win an indulgence. Mindful of the faithful who cannot afford to fly to Brazil, the Vatican's sacred apostolic penitentiary, penitentiary a court which handles the forgiveness of sins. You get, I mean, you hear what I'm saying? They have a court that handles forgiveness of sins. It's not Jesus Christ. It's a man-made court. 
has also extended the privilege to those following the rites and pious exercises of the event on television, radio, and through social media. So now they're just saying, you know, there's this week-long youth event going on in Brazil. And if you go to this week-long event and you participate in and you're doing all your good Catholic stuff at this event, hey, it's going to knock off some time that you have in purgatory because you're doing some good works. And then they say, well, we understand that not everyone can fly to Brazil. So here's what, what we'll do for you guys, for you, for you less fortunate. If you just sit there and you watch it on TV and you're, you're following along with it or you're following on social media or on the radio, You'll, you'll, get, you'll get some time off of your sentence too. It's ridiculous. And this, this, is, this is what's coming out of the, the, the Catholic Church. It says, the, the article continues on, it says, that includes following Twitter, said a source at the penitentiary referring to Pope Francis' Twitter account, which has gathered 7 million followers. But you must be following the events live. It is not as if you can get an indulgence by chatting on the internet. So you, know, you can't just go back to it later and just be chatting and playing around the internet in order to receive your indulgence. You actually have to be watching live. Like these, these guys, he's got 7 million followers on Twitter. Yes, people are, do believe this. And I'm going to get to that at the end of the sermon of why this is so, because it is dangerous, because people do believe it. People believe that the things that the Pope says is that he's the man of God and he's speaking God's word. When he is acting as the Pope, the things that he says are as authoritative or more than the Bible. See, the Catholics believe that it's not just Scripture that's important. They say, yeah, the Bible's important, but the church and their tradition and the Pope is important. And that basically whatever the Pope says as his office of Pope, that God is just using him at all times in that position. And the things he say are like directly from God. That we continue to get word from God. Now, um, turn if you would to Deuteronomy chapter 14. This is what's being taught. I mean, this is what's out there today. And I've recently been getting all these... Uh, you know, people on, on YouTube. And I don't, I don't understand why. Maybe you know, I preach a sermon, why Catholics aren't saved. And these Catholics have been coming out and making these comments. And, you know, I kind of feel bad for them because they're not saved. I mean, they're, they're, their mind is clouded. They, they, have a, they have a veil over their eyes. They don't understand the Bible. And they've been lied to. But they're failing to see their own, their own hypocrisy of the Catholic Church. And, and these things are so blatantly obvious. You know, when the Bible says, call no man father upon the earth, you know, for one is your father in heaven. And they're like, oh, no, no, that's not, you know, like, what else do you even get that to mean? They call their priest's father. And they call their dad father at home. So it's like, they'll say, oh, well, that just means in home. Like, well, you call your dad father. And you call the priest father. So what's it talking about? He just didn't even mean what he said. Well, I, I'm just going to say this, and who knows what the meaning really is, call no man on earth father. Because you're still going to continue to just call everybody father. It's actually holy father. Holy. Holy Father. So, oh, so, that, so it's not just Father. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's worse. Of course, it's worse. <laughs> but trying to, to, to use their warped rationalization of it. But in any event, though, and, and one of the ways they do see what they also teach about purgatory is that people who are alive today can, should be praying for people who have already passed on that are in purgatory. And they say that your prayers will help them get out of there faster. Okay, that's, that's the other thing that they do. And you can do these different rituals and ceremonies and stuff for people who are dead and in order to get them out of purgatory faster. Now, this concept, though, of doing things for the dead, it's not new with Catholicism. That did not originate with the Catholic Church. But I'll tell you what, it also did not originate with the Christianity or the one true religion of the Lord. This was around a long time ago. If you're in Deuteronomy 14, we're going to see a couple of commandments that explicitly say not to do things for the dead in the laws of Moses from way back when. Okay, Even in Moses' day and before, People had this belief of doing things for the dead. 
as if it's going to do anything. I got news for you. When somebody is physically dead, there is nothing more that can be done for that person. Our opportunities for salvation rely only on your time alive on this earth. Once, once you breathe your last breath, your time is over. You have no more time to make a decision and no one else can do anything for you. You are either carried into heaven or you are going down to hell. That's it. No amount of prayer on earth by your relatives and family and friends can do anything for you if you're burning in hell. Not going to happen. Purgatory is not existent. Show me this in the Bible. And the only other place that they have, you know, I was looking up these different verses. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Is they'll turn to the book of 2 Maccabees, which is like an apocryphal book. It's not, it's not accepted by our church. It's not accepted by the true Christian faith as being canon, as being scripture, as being inspired by God. But that's like, there's only one place that they could really turn where it says anything even close uh, I mean, the verses I already showed you, they, show, they say nothing about going to a holding place in between heaven and hell. Nothing. You would have to already have that concept and try to make it fit into Scripture somewhere to use the verses that they use to try to support their doctrine. It's non-existent. But um, look at Deuteronomy 14, verse number 1. The Bible says, Ye are the children of the Lord your God. Ye shall not cut yourselves, nor make any boldness between your eyes for the dead. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above all the nations that are upon the earth. He's making an extinction, a, a distinction with his people and telling them something here that says, I do not want you making baldness between your eyes for the dead. Now, most of us say, I don't know anyone that actually knows like, like what he's referring to here. Obviously, it was a practice that was going on at the time, though, by false religion. The, the, the culture or the false religions of the day were doing this where they were shaving and making some amount of baldness between their eyes for the dead. As, as, as for whatever reason, you know, and who know, it, it, it's, stup it's stupid. Who knows what their reasoning was? It doesn't matter because it, it's not going to do anything. But God explicitly put in his commandments, I don't want you doing this. He says, I don't want you cutting yourself or making baldness between your eyes for the dead. And he specifically says, for the dead, for those that are dead. Don't do that. That's, uh, it's not allowed in God's law. Turn, uh, flip over to chapter 26 of Deuteronomy. Chapter 26. And we're going to see something similar. But here we're going to see in Deuteronomy 26 some of the, the rules laid out for tithing when the people would give the tenth of their increase to the Levites. Look, we'll start reading verse number 12. Uh, Deuteronomy 26, verse 12. When thou hast made an end of tithing all the tithes of thine increase the third year, which is the year of tithing, and hast given it unto the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, that they may eat within thy gates and be filled, then shalt thou say before the Lord thy God, I have brought away the hallowed things out of mine house. And also have given them unto the Levite and unto the stranger, to the fatherless and to the widow, according to all thy commandments, which thou hast commanded me. I have not transgressed thy commandments, neither have I forgotten them. So he says, okay, when, you, when you're done with your tithing and you bring everything in and it's for the Levite, it's for the fatherless, it's for the widow, you know, you do all these things. And he's saying, look, I've done all this stuff. I haven't transgressed. I've done everything you've told me to. But he continues on into verse 14. Look at verse 14. I have not eaten thereof in my mourning, you know, being sorrow and sadful. He says, I haven't eaten thereof in my morning, neither have I taken away aught thereof for any unclean use, nor given aught thereof for the dead. He said, I haven't given any part of these tithes and offerings for the dead. But I have hearkened to the voice of the Lord my God and have done according to all that thou hast commanded me. Now, here we see very clearly saying, look, I followed what you told me to do, and in following, I didn't offer any of my tithe. I didn't pay anything for the dead. But what does the Catholic Church do? You can pay and offer up offerings and have these rituals and things to, you know, for the dead, to help out the dead. And we see the exact opposite actually written in God's law. 
Uh, Psalm 106, you don't have to turn there. Psalm 106, 28 says, they joined themselves also unto Baal Peor. Now, what he's referring to in Baal Peor was, if you remember, uh, Balaam, the prophet, what, he was the one who had his ass speaking with man's voice. He was, he was hired to go and curse the children of Israel. So Balaam was hired and he's on his way and, and you know, his, his ass is, is, is moving him out of the way and like ramming him up against the wall and stuff because the ass is trying to avoid the angel of the Lord that's standing there with his sword drawn ready to kill Balaam for going and doing what God didn't tell him to do. So his ass is trying to protect him. So, you know, Balaam's whipping him and just be like, what are you doing? You know, come on. And then God allowed the ass to speak unto him. And it's a great story. It's, it's really weird, but it's, it's really cool. And uh, I recommend you reading if you're not familiar with the story. And um, so all of this is going on. And, and anyways, Balaam gets to where he's going. You know, God speaks to him and says, okay, look, don't curse him. You know, and he says, whatever I tell you to do, that's what you're going to say. And um, so Balaam, you know, the, the, the king's trying to get him to, to prophesy against Israel. He won't do it. Three times he asked him, he won't do it. But then later on, you know, as the children of Israel are in the land, Balaam gets them into sin. They, they start committing sin. They start taking wives of the heathen of the land. And they start offering sacrifices up unto the false gods. So I'm giving you that backstory because in Psalm 106, it's referring back to this event of Baal Peor. And this is what it's talking about at that place, Baal Peor, is where, where this happened with, with, with Balaam and the children of Israel um, committing sin. It says, They joined themselves also into Baal Peor and ate the sacrifices of the dead. Thus they provoked him to anger with their inventions and the plague break in upon him. See, this was their own inventions. This is something they came up with. This isn't something that God ordained, but it's something that they were doing. They were eating sacrifices of the dead. Offering up sacrifices to the dead. They were doing it to false gods. And it says here, part of the ritual was eating sacrifices of the dead. Which again, this is something that the Catholic Church teaches is a good thing to do. Now, I know they're not doing animal sacrifices today to say, well, it's not exactly the same thing. But look, the concept's exactly the same. We've already seen now Three places in the Old Testament that talk about not doing things for the dead. And you will never find one place that says, do something for the dead. Do this for the dead. Do that for the dead. The only place you can find anything like that is, in, like I said, in that book of 2 Maccabees, which is not Scripture. Which is not inspired by God. It's just in a historical text, which is a counterfeit. Another reason why the, the Catholics believe in this, this idea of purgatory is that they have, uh, they're confused about sanctification. And sancti you know, being sanctified is being set apart and being holy, right? So they're saying, well, it's, it's a process where you're forgiven by Christ, but you're not fully sanctified until you go through the whole purgatory process, and then you're completely clean. And they'll use Revelation 21, 27 as a proof. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Because we'll see the truth about the matter. But they quote, they'll cite Revelation 21, 27 as a proof for why purgatory is necessary, why it even has to exist. So they try to go these logical proofs, say, well, you know, we need to have, purgatory has to be real because Revelation 21, 27 says, and talking about heaven, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So they're saying, see, I mean, there's no sin. You can't have any sin whatsoever there. So purgatory is necessary in order for people to, to make it into heaven because, you know, it's, there's not allowed to have any of these things in heaven. There's no sin in heaven. But first of all, in that verse it says, but they which are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So if your name's in the Lamb's Book of Life, you're going to be there. Right? I mean, it, that's obviously what this verse says. And it's also just a misunderstanding of, you know, the flesh. When your flesh is gone, it's the flesh that causes us to sin. It's this sinful flesh. The spirit, the born-again believer, the spirit is a new creature. It cannot sin. Read 1 John chapter 3. It says you cannot sin. 
He was, whatsoever is born of God doth not commit sin. The new creature doesn't sin. So when we die and we leave this, this fleshly body behind, we don't have those sins anymore. So that's why you get to go into heaven. The sins aren't there anymore. And the, the fleshly sins remain behind, but your soul has been cleansed. Any sins you've committed, Jesus Christ has cleansed that. And that's what we're going to see in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Look at verse number 9. Verse number 9 says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. He's saying you're not going to go to heaven if you're any of these things. All these things, you know, these sins. You're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. But look at what he says in verse 11. And such were some of you. He said, were some of you. But what's the difference? You've done these things. You've done some of these things. You know, maybe you were a drunkard. But what happened? He says, but ye are washed. Ye are sanctified. It's not this long process that you need to go through all of purgatory in order to be sanctified. He says, look, ye were a drunkard, but ye are washed. Right now, present tense, you are washed through the blood of Jesus Christ. You are sanctified. Ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. It's happened and it's done. You have been washed, sanctified, and cleansed completely clean. No amount of your works is going to make up for the sins that you've done. It can't. I use this example about soul winning all the time too. Is that look, if I were to if I were to commit some crime, let's say I were to steal somebody's car, or or or, or even worse, let's say I were to physically attack somebody or kill somebody, and I were to be standing before the judge, and the judge, and I'm found guilty because I committed the crime. If the judge were to say to me, you know, hey, you're guilty, you know, you're going to be punished. Do you have anything to say? I say, well, wait, judge, you know, before you sentence me, I just, you just need to know that, yeah, I committed that crime, I'm guilty of murder, but you should see what I've done with my life. I've helped people out, I've given money to charity, I've done all these good works. My, my next door neighbor, my old lady, she has to go up this flight of stairs. Every single day she comes home with groceries, I help her carry up those groceries. I do all this good work, I go to church, I help people out. Is he going to say, oh, okay, then you're not going to be punished for murder anymore because you've done all these good things and it's made up for what you've done in the murder. No way. No just judge will do that. They're going to say, well, great. I'm glad you did those good things, but guess what? You commit this crime and there's a punishment for this crime that none of your good works is going to make up for. Our sin is the same way. Look, when you commit transgressions against God, it doesn't matter how much other good things you do. It doesn't make up for the sin that you've done wrong. You need to be forgiven. It needs to be cleansed. It needs to be washed. And the only way that can happen is through the blood of Jesus Christ. Otherwise, you're facing the penalty on your own. God rewards you for the good works that you do. It's not the good works that make up for your sin. It doesn't work both ways. The last place that they use, well, I don't know if it's the last place that they use, but the, the last main justification for a place other than heaven or hell that what, you know, when, when someone dies, that to, to say from Scripture, well, Scripture says there's something else, or there's other than heaven and hell, is in 1 Peter chapter 3. And you could turn there if you'd like. I'm not going to go too far in depth on this. Actually, Pastor Romero just preached a really great sermon on this recently, and I had a chance to listen to it, and he did a very good job of explaining this, and he went to lots of passages to prove it to you, and I'm not going to take the time to do that tonight. But it's one of those verses that can be somewhat confusing, and it's amazing how much false doctrine comes out of these verses that can appear to be somewhat confusing. So you look at it and say, oh, I wonder what that's kind of saying. It's, it's, it's a little bit, it's not quite so clear with the wording that it's using. 
but to take it all the way in this weird direction of saying, well, there's purgatory is ridiculous. First Peter chapter 3, verse 18 reads, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison which sometime were disobedient when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a-preparing wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. So they'll say, see? Jesus went and preached unto the spirits in prison. And they'll just, just say that, like, because of that verse, that it must have been this purgatory place. That, you know, well, heaven's not prison. And, and they're saying that, that he was in this place because... Christ hasn't died on the cross yet, so they were just being kept in this prison until Jesus Christ opened up heaven and stuff. Look, it's, it's, that's not true. It's not scriptural. And just real briefly, just to help you understand this passage a little bit, you have to read the whole thing in context, which is why we did verses 18, 19, and 20, and not just verse 19. Okay, this is talking about Jesus going and preaching unto the spirits in prison. And like I said, Pastor Romero did a great job of this. Just because it says the word spirits doesn't necessarily even mean that it's talking about people who have already passed on and they're existing someplace after death. There are other examples in the Bible where it talks about spirits, where it's talking about just people. Because we have spirits. We have souls. And we have the flesh of the body. So just because he uses this word spirits doesn't mean that it automatically implies that he's talking to people who have already passed on. And furthermore, it goes on to bring up the days of Noah. Noah. And that, that's when he went and preached unto these people when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Loa. It says, and they were sometime disobedient, these spirits that are in prison that he's referring to, these people that he was preaching to. Now, I believe this is talking about the preaching that was happening before the flood came to the people who were going to face this judgment upon the earth. And I think it's that simple. And I don't think, you know, there's, there's much else you could take from the, when you read this in context that that's what was happening here. But they'll go to this passage as well. And if you don't if you don't like the, you know, my explanation for it, you know, whatever, fine. But to say that this verse teaches that purgatory is real, it's not there. I mean, it's just not there. Now, the main reason why I'm preaching this is because of the danger. I you know the title is the dangerous the dangerous doctrine of purgatory. And why is it so important? You could say, well, that, it's just a ridiculous doctrine anyways. But yeah, but there's so many people that believe it. There's so many Catholics out there that think this is true. And here's why it's such a big deal and such a huge problem and such a false doctrine that needs to be preached against is because when you go out and we talk to people, people don't seem to care about the gospel. And most of the reason what I believe is because they think, well, I'm not bad enough to go to hell. Most people don't think they're bad enough to go to hell. And they say, well, I'm not good enough to go to heaven. You say, yeah, if you were to die today, do you think you'd go to heaven? Most people will be like, yeah, I don't know. I don't think so. You know, like, I'm not sure. But they still think, well, I'm a pretty good person. I don't know for sure if I'm going to heaven. And what we're failing to understand is, do they believe that there's a purgatory? That there's a place where, you know, because it, most people think, well, I'm not so bad that God's going to send me to hell. You know, I, I haven't ever murdered somebody. That's the most common thing. It's not like I've murdered. I haven't killed anybody. I mean, I'm not that bad. There's really bad people out there. I'm not like one of those people. So why would God send me to hell? It's this whole concept of there's this other place. Well, yeah, no, maybe I'm not good enough to go to heaven. Yeah, I know. I'm, I do things that are wrong. Okay, I admit it. You know, I like to drink. I like to smoke. I like to do all these things. And I'm not the best person. I'm no saint. But I'm not so bad that I deserve to go to hell. And this is the mentality that people have. And it's being fed and fueled by the Catholic doctrine of purgatory of just, well, you know, there's this place and you'll just go there. But overall, in the end, you're going to be in heaven too because you're not that bad. And this is the extremely, this is the reason why people just, they don't even feel, they don't have the proper fear of hell. They don't have the proper fear of the appropriate judgment for their sins that they need to have so that they could realize, no, I need a Savior. There's no other way to get to the Father but through Jesus Christ. 
He is the only one that can forgive me of my sins. No man that dresses in a dress and goes behind a curtain and calls himself father can forgive your sins. Jesus Christ is the only one that can forgive your sins. And people need to realize that. And, and it's this, this cloud that's over their heads where they think that it's just not that big of a deal. Because somehow they know that eventually things will be all okay in the end. Even though they can't say that they know that they'd go to heaven, one day it's all going to work itself out. And the whole alarm and, and reality of, look, you are going one place or the other, hasn't set in. Because they think there's this third option, which really isn't that bad. I mean, it's not hell. And eventually I'm going to go to heaven anyways. And this is why it's so dangerous, because it gets people to just go to sleep, not care, not even worry about it, and not think about it. I guarantee you a lot more people will be worried about it if they believe there are only two options are heaven and hell. That's it. If you don't, if you, if you don't, if you're not, you know, quote unquote, good enough to go to heaven, you're going to hell. And you're going to burn forever and ever and ever. There would, I think there would be more people just at least being concerned about that if they didn't believe in this third place called purgatory. People's salvation is important and what we believe about these things is important and laying out the doctrine and being able to turn to these verses and just show them, look, I mean, Luke 16 is an excellent example. You don't have to turn to 2 Corinthians 5 like I did or some of the other places I turned to, but if you have a Catholic or someone who believes in these, you know, this idea of, of this alternate place that you can go to, Luke 16 shows you Lazarus dying, going to heaven, and the rich man dying and going to hell. The only two places. And it happens right away. There's no in-between stage. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words, for the Bible, dear God, for uh, this clear teaching, dear God. I pray that you would please just help us to be able to straighten people out that, that might be confused about this issue and about the afterlife and where they're going to spend eternity, dear Lord. I pray that you would please just help us to combat this, this false heretical teaching of a purgatory, whether it be the Baptist preaching it, whether the Catholics preaching it, or anyone else preaching it, dear Lord that there's this, this place or this, this punishment for, for believers that's either hell or, or something similar to hell, dear Lord, but that, uh, you know, for these people who don't believe that they are completely washed and cleansed from their sin through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, that is what the Bible teaches over and over again. And... Um, there is no confusion or doubt about this matter. So help us to be able to show other people the, the same truth from the Bible. Dear Lord, equip us, equip our minds, help us to know your word and know it well enough to be able to teach others. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.